Bienvenidos al norte de Argentina. Welcome everybody to the north of Argentina, a very special region in this absolutely mammoth South American country. In this video, we will head high into the Andes Mountains to get a taste of the indigenous side of life here. I arrived in a small town called Ticada on Sunday, Palm Sunday in fact, and I was awoken by the sounds of drums, chants, and marching. I peered out of the window and found the whole city center filled with pilgrims, getting ready to do a ceremonial walk celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was a welcome cultural experience for my first day, and I knew there would be so much more to see. Come along. So I welcome you now to Pucara de Tilcara. This site was home to an ancient indigenous people who inhabited this land, and specifically this settlement from the first century AD until the Spanish arrived and it was abandoned. While these stone settlements may seem modest, they were once home to a very important faction during the Incan times in which this site was used as a religious and political hub for all of the people who were living on the south part of the Andes in this region. This area here is what they're calling the ceremonial area. And in the 15th century, when the Incans took over this land, just as the Spanish did to places that they took over, they made the local people here convert to being a part of the sun cult. So they think that this area was used for worshiping the Incan sun god, as well as using this area to look at the stars and the heavens above. One of the most striking things you can see up here, besides of course the very painted and colorful mountains, are these forests of large cactus. And the interesting part is that sometimes you can see a dead cactus where you can see the cactus wood, which they used for many different building materials in this region. They were using this material here for churches, for doors, for uh, roofing, and it's I've just never seen anything like this. Here on the top of the hill, which sits Pucara del Ticara, is a monument that was built in 1935. It's a monument that was built by the archaeologists as a signifier of the presence of the people here, and it was kind of a tribute to Mesoamerican uh, pyramid architecture, which ironically isn't necessarily even from here. On the top of this monument is actually supposed to be a statue, so theoretically it's not even completed, but it sits over this incredible valley, which you can see has lush grassland on the bottom and is protected on all sides by the lower regions of the Andes Mountains. Behind the monument, we can see sort of an original recreation of the houses that the people of Pucara were living in um, at the time before the colonial period. So these people in the Andes were particularly great stone crafters in the fact that they were able to create dwellings without using cement or other binding materials. We can see this in Machu Picchu and other examples of Incan architecture, but uh, this also extends to this area. So these are some of the traditional stone dwellings and huts that they have um, up here on the mountain. And then Interestingly enough, you can see the new dwellings, which honestly haven't changed that much since this time in history. One of my favorite parts about this region is that you can see here, there's a farm dedicated to some llamas. And llamas were very important for this region, both used as uh, wool to keep people warm in the, in the winter, as a pack animal to transport goods across the very treacherous Andes Mountains, and of course as, fo as food. And there are many restaurants, even today, where you can get llama steaks, llama uh, milanesa, a very traditional Argentinian dish, and even llama soup. It's just about a 20 minute walk into the newer city of Tilcara, which sits in the valley just below. The city has a vibrant spirit. It's clearly a stop for regional and international tourists alike, and boasts cute little cafes, restaurants, and pensions. Walking along the old dusty streets, I saw a gathering of street vendors selling traditional bites and drinks. I knew I had to try some. So from this very kind little lady, street food vendor, much respect, 
we've bought something called api, which is some sort of tea, she said, that's made with um, like blue corn or purple corn. And then they add some spices. It kind of smells like blue vine. Like it's, it's very, it's very fruity and has like cloves and other sort of spices in there. So very curious about this. Oh, Ooh. that's hot. Oh, I burned the shit out of my mouth. Whew. So minus the burning the shit out of my mouth, it's very, um, it's very sweet. It doesn't taste like corn and it's got this sort of enriching quality. I honestly don't know how to describe it. If you're ever in Northern Argentina, try some api for yourself. So here we have the homemade tortilla, is what they're calling it, which is stuffed tortilla relleno. Uh, I don't know, it's, it seems kind of like a calzone situation. They cook it on the open coals. And then on the inside here, we've got some cheese, we've got some olives and some tomato. Not sure how traditional this is to the region. Looks like a little Spanish native combination, but looks very tasty. So let's give it a shot. Mm. It's just like a very delicious quesadilla. For the next food stop, I tried to find the most traditional, least touristy place on the map. I lucked out and found El Salteño, a local joint selling northern classics. So here at the traditional table, we've ordered two things that are very interesting. Number one is locro, which if you watch my Argentina episode, it's a stew made of hominy, beans, and some type of meat. Kind of looks like beef probably, although it could be llama. And this is the serious piece right here. A big hunk of llama, including a large bone. We've got two potatoes. The most interesting part is that potatoes actually come from this region naturally. In a sort of red sauce with peas, served with rice. I've never seen anything like this, but I'm so excited to try it. So I'm gonna try this llama. You gotta get yourself a nice piece of llama. So here is the llama. I took a poll on my Instagram yesterday and asked people if they would eat llama. I got some no's, but I would ask, why wouldn't you eat llama? Cows are not natural to this area, and it's very mountainous. Llamas are the lifeblood of this community. So why not also eat them, you know? So, cheers. Mm. Good one. The llama is, it kind of tastes like a, sort of like a beef. Honestly, there's no way to even tell that it would be llama. It doesn't taste any sort of different type of way. This, uh, this knuckle has got a lot of collagen in it. Very interesting. And the sauce is nice and fresh, tomatoey, served with some really nice Spanish style rice. Delicioso. So here's the locro. And the most interesting thing about this is you can see these big pieces of fat which flavor the whole dish. So let's try the locro. Beanie hearty, the meat's super tender. Got a little bit of uh, chives on top. Very nice, very like hardworking village people food. I totally get why they eat it. We've made it now to the small park or plaza here in the middle of Tilcara. And I want to say something about this region of northern Argentina that's very specific. So when we think of Argentina and we think of the culture of Argentina, a lot of what comes to mind is the gauchos, the pampas, um, a lot of the European influence that came in through the immigration from Spain, from Italy. I think that is the identity of Argentina. This area of Argentina, however, never really got incorporated. While they did absorb some Spanish influence, like the people of course today are celebrating Palm Sunday, and they have this very lively festival, and they are Christians here, um, many of them never really incorporated into the Argentinian, uh, let's say, lifestyle. So the lifestyle here is much more similar to those living in Bolivia across the border, which is just about two hours by car. Um, these people are very interesting because they are theoretically the last 
area of Argentina that speaks a indigenous language. These people speak the southern branch of the Quechua language, which was the main language group of the Incans. And so these are the descendants of the Incans who live here. And so um, in the small villages around this area, um, and then as you get north into Bolivia and north into uh, Peru, the Quechua culture becomes a lot more strong. But here in Argentina, most people don't realize that, that there is a thriving, small, but still thriving, um, indigenous community of people, of native Quechua speakers who, um, and sometimes, in many ways, are monolingual, and they speak Spanish as their second language, or maybe they know some Spanish. So if you live in a city like this, of course you're gonna speak Spanish. If you send your kids to a more formal school, they'll of course learn Spanish, but there are many Quechua speakers who speak Quechua and Quechua alone, and they can still be found. So maybe one day we'll find them when we head to Bolivia. It's very exciting. And in all honesty, with the pan flutes and the llamas and all of that, this feels a million miles away from, from Buenos Aires, and it's really incredible to me how big Argentina is that this is part of their country and it honestly has nothing recognizable that says I'm, I'm in Argentina. There's something very particular that you can find here in the lower part of the Andes that is in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Northern Chile, and in Peru. And that is the presence of the coca leaf. Now, yes, this is the leaf that cocaine is made from, but coca leaves in this part of the world are used specifically for medicinal remedies in tea and to help people deal with altitude sickness. You can buy coca leaves pretty much anywhere around here, and you can also buy these very lovely coca leaf candies, which you can suck on and get the same, let's say, effects. You get a mild stimulant, nothing more than like a cup of coffee, so people feel energized during the day. It can help with altitude sickness as the areas in this region are very high. Um, where we went to these uh, El Hornacal, which is these painted mountains which we're opening this video, um, that's 4,300 meters above sea level. Very, very high, what's considered very high altitude. Sometimes people experience vomiting, nausea, they pass out because there's a lot less oxygen in the air. So as a native little uh, little treat, they offer these. Um, pretty much everyone has them. You can buy them everywhere. So um, if you ever do come up here to Peru, to Bolivia, and you're dealing with altitude sickness, always ask for caramelo duro de coca, hard candies, uh, coca hard candies. And if you're more of a hardcore guy like me, you'll go for some leaves. What was recommended to me is that you take two leaves per day or you know however much you want. You put it in the side of your mouth, like that. You can chew on it, or you can just suck on it for about 20 minutes. You'll start feeling the effects. Uh, it's very mild. I can say you don't really feel any sort of really stimulating serious effect. It has nothing to do with cocaine. But if you're flying back to the United States from Argentina, and you forget this in your bag, realize that you're transporting hard narcotics into the United States, and you will be punished. So if you buy this, make sure to leave it here in the region, these Andes regions. Do not, do not, do not bring this back to the United States with you. This is actually illegal in almost every country, except these ones. And it's completely unregulated in this part of the world. And the thing is, they don't actually make it into cocaine in this area very much. That's uh, mostly due to the Colombian trade, the Peruvian trade, so. There you go, coca, mm, stimulating. With the sun setting on my time in Tilcara, I took a four hour bus ride back down the mountain to the largest city in the region, Salta. Cruising down the Andes, you get a spectacular view of what the region is known for. Harsh, jagged mountains, river valleys, and lots and lots of windy roads. Salta, a city of about 700,000, is known for its extremely impressive Spanish style plaza, adorned with ornate architecture and epic Baroque churches and cathedrals. Salta felt extremely different than Buenos Aires, both in style and in culture. It felt much more akin to my time in Oaxaca, Mexico, than any of the days that I spent in the Argentinian capital. Maybe it was the mountain fresh air or the colorful buildings. To get to know the city better, I decided to head to the central market to try some local food in a truly local setting. Now I'm in Salta's municipal market, San Miguel. A really nice local central market with lots of local, delicious Argentinian products. So let's go try some. 
The first thing that caught my eye when I stepped into the market was a spice vendor who was selling various regional spices for incredibly cheap prices. So I've just bought two very traditional local spices here in Argentina. One is a ground chili that's found locally in the mountains in the north up here, ají picante, so it should become kind of spicy. And then here is the most traditional thing that you'll find in Argentina as far as spices go. This is chimichurri mix. It's normally served with the steak, so it's a mix of parsley, some chilies, and then you put oil on top of it and use it as a dipping sauce. Very traditional and all of this for less than 50 cents, which is kind of insane. This is a really exciting local market. They have everything from knockoff, sports jerseys, glasses, all the knockoff stuff you want. They have, of course, mate and other local, let's say, Bolivian, Argentinian things. And then mixed in with it all, they have other food products, like these are all processed fruits, local membrillo or a paste made from quince. They sell the traditional um, coca leaf situation down here, which is a very Bolivian thing. Um, and you can buy large amounts of coca leaves, I believe, right there. I think the most interesting about the market here in Salta versus what you would find in Buenos Aires is you find this really large connection that they have between the people here and the people in Bolivia and Peru, that Quechua sort of culture, as opposed to... Hola, como esta? Good morning. Good morning. Todo bien? Yeah, okay, todo okay, bien. okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Bro. Thank you, thank you. As I was saying, you find this really nice combination between Bolivian culture this sort of Andes Mountain people, the Quechua speakers, where the clothes are different, uh, the food is different, the vibe is different, but in this sort of Argentinian context. You can see that specifically in this stall where they have the traditional Quechua looking people, the mountain people all dressed up, these weird little baby guys, and then the, um, the Quechua flag, the flag of the Central Andes people. Here you can see large bags of coca leaves that they use for that stimulating feel. Very interesting, would be very, very illegal anywhere else in the world. Sat down now at a very local place here in the second floor of the market. You can see just normal people having some early lunch, and of course, the very important, I think that's Hotel Transylvania playing, and this little girl, she's loving it. So I've ordered something traditional to this region, but also to the region of South America. This is a tamale. We have these in New Mexico, we have these in Mexico, but here in Argentina, they are wrapped in a small ball. Typically, it's a masa with some meat inside, and then wrapped in a corn husk and steamed. And then an interesting thing they have here specifically is called yasqua. This is a sauce that comes from the Andes Mountains. Normally, uh, kind of Quechua food, Bolivian food, but they basically have it as a side sauce everywhere in the northern part of Argentina. Ooh. Wow! Ooh. Ooh. So it looks like we've got the masa on the outside. That's corn flour. We've got inside some beef and potatoes. I'm gonna take a little bit of the yasgua, put it on top, and give it a try. Oh. The meat is nice. You can taste a little bit of the onion and of the uh, and of the potato, but the real kicker is that yasgua. It's nice and spicy, very fresh, very salty, delicious. With my time in Northern Argentina coming to a close, it was a very different experience than what I had imagined. It's truly a region of color, tradition, and culture. The people were warm and friendly, the food tasty, and the architecture unique. Based on this trip, I think that Argentina is a lot more diverse than people give it credit for. And it's a place where you can still find people who have been doing things the way that their parents and grandparents have been doing them for the past thousand years. In the new world, we aren't always aware of the ancient cultures that predated our newer ones, but I'm glad I found a region tucked up in the mountains that is still keeping true to form. From llama steaks to pan flutes, northern Argentina is a must-see place on any trip to the region, and a spot I won't soon forget. 
If you like the video, make sure to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Always helps me out. We will see you in the next video. Hasta luego from Northern Argentina.